my this is hopeless. My feet are so hard. I just wish I could be done with my assignments already. Why don't you do your math and art homework at the same time? Believe me, I'd like to, but there's just no way. Nothing's impossible if you believe hard enough. Okay, who said that? I did. Hello. Oh, it's just you. How are you, Summer? Fine, thanks. How are things with you? Oh, 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 oh. So what's up? It's my math and art homework. I have a big math presentation and art project due tomorrow, and I don't know where to start on either one. I just feel lost when I look at either assignment. Maybe you can make some sense of what I'm supposed to do here. Let me take a look. Hmm. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yes. I think I know how I can help you. Follow me! Uh, Summer? I'm just going to my garage to help me finish my assignments. I need some supplies to properly show you how math and art are interrelated. After all, math and art are all around us. It's just a matter of knowing where to look. I'm not sure I follow. Well, take this bicycle wheel. This wheel can represent the unit circle used in calculus. The spokes on the wheel create clear dividing points between the angles most commonly used in the unit circle, which range from 0 to 360 degrees, or 0 to 2 pi radians. Likewise, the spokes represent the radius of the unit circle, which is, obviously, one unit in length, with each spoke also acting as a hypotenuse for different types of right triangles. The most common types of right triangles used in calculus include the 30-60-90 degree triangles and the 45-45-90 degree triangles. The way to remember the conversion between degree and radian measurements is to multiply degree measurements by pi over 180 to get radians, and to multiply radian measurements by 180 over pi to get degrees. As for trig functions, the right triangles created from each spoke helps one to remember how to calculate for each trig function. Depending on where the angle is in the right triangle, the leg opposite the angle over the hypotenuse creates the sine function for that angle. Likewise, the leg adjacent to the angle over the hypotenuse creates the cosine function for that angle, and the leg opposite over the leg adjacent the angle creates the tangent function for that angle. Uh-huh, uh-huh. What about the arc? Oh yeah. Aside from the math that can be found in this bicycle wheel, the wheel also represents different aspects of the color wheel used in art. Many color wheels incorporate the basics of primary, secondary, tertiary, and even neutral color. Also, if one takes the time to look at the different types of artwork in the world, there is a clear merge that exists between math and art. Abstract works such as the bicycle wheel piece by Marcel Duchamp and the split and twisted piece by Paul Sisko employ concepts of unit circles and angles respectively in their works. Likewise, many of the patterns seen on curtains, wallpapers, measurement gauges, logos, and other forms of pop culture use concepts such as angles, trick functions, and the color wheel in their patterns and designs. It's amazing how much math and art can be seen together in the world, huh, August? August? Really? Oh, sorry. I totally stopped listening after you said pie. Want some? No, thanks. But your pie gives me an idea on how to explain math and order around us. Hand me that pie. If you look closely at the slice of pie you just ate, one could use math to find the area of each slice. The straight pie slice edge can be thought of as radius r for our circular pie, and the corner of the pie slice represents the angle created by the slice, which for our purposes will be measured in radians and represented by theta. Now to find the curved edge, or arc s, of each pie slice, the equation is simply r equals s over theta, or s equals r times theta, and the area a of each slice is defined by a equals one half times r times s, or a equals one half times r squared times theta. Also, the pie slices themselves can be used in different design elements and decorative patterns. They can even teach parts of the color wheel, such as gradation of colors, monochromatic colors, complementary and split complementary colors, analogous colors, triadic colors, and warm and cool colors. Wow, thanks. I really feel like I understand what you're saying, but I think I need more examples to truly grasp how math and art are interrelated. I'm glad you want to learn more, August, my friend, because I was just getting started. Behold! Uh, 
summer. Not that I don't enjoy the outdoors or anything, but what exactly am I beholding? What you are about to witness are the wonders of painting and limits. And what better place to observe than your own front lawn? I don't know. A museum or a library? Anyway, let's look at what happens while riding something like a skateboard. If you look at the different tricks being performed, along with the different skid marks left behind, they all represent different types of brush strokes and line patterns that can be created using any type of art supplies. Some of these patterns and marks are even featured in major works such as Edvard Munch's The Scream and Vincent van Gogh's The Starry Night. Also, if you perform these tricks on a ramp, they can represent different types of curves of piecewise functions drawn on the XY plane of a graph. I see we're getting back into the math intensive part of the lesson. Exactly, but that was just a warm-up. Uh. The shape of each ramp is reminiscent of the behavior of limits. Limits are the values a given function reaches as the input values reach a desired value from the left and right side of the function. This helps to better understand the behavior of a function at a particular point. Also, depending on the function, a given point can either have a finite limit, a limit that goes to infinity, or a limit that doesn't exist. If the graph is continuous at the input point, one can simply graph the limit function and plug in the input value to get the limit. I call this the graph and plug-in method. However, if the limit value is empty at the input point, then one has to look at how the limit value is approached from both the left and right sides of the graph. If the same value is approached from both sides, then the limit exists, and if not, then the limit does not exist. The graphs of limits can also be used to create the basis for works of art such as the Kilroy Was Here graffiti symbol and Keith Haring's graffiti figures. Amazing! I get what you're saying, but do you have any other real-world examples you can show me? Sure. You see this ramp? Yeah. Imagine that the ramp is the left-hand behavior of a graph. The ramp is a curve that goes up and stops at a specific point. Now imagine that the ground that lies beneath the edge of the ramp is the right-hand behavior of a graph, where the ground acts as a straight, horizontal line. If you draw a vertical line starting at the edge of the ramp and ending at the ground, you'll see that the graphs created by the ramp and the ground stop at completely different points on that vertical line. This means that the limit between the edge of the ramp and the ground does not exist. Huh. The limit does not exist. Exactly. August. The limit does not exist! That was awesome! So what's next? I think that's enough for now. It's best not to strain the brain. That's fair. Thanks for all your help today, Summer. No problem, August. And remember, kids, graphs and sketches are your friends, and will always be there to help you understand what math and art have in common. Who are you talking to? I'll tell you later. So long, friends. Till next time.